Right, that's how it's gonna go down. Oh, guys, look, you're on Facebook Live already and you didn't even know it. Hey, Facebook Live! Whoa, craziness! Okay. Hi, Facebook Live. Five, six, seven, eight to the left. <laughs> to the right. To the right. Now slide, baby, slide. Come on. I know you all wanna be re right now and get up and show your finest dance moves, right? It's a joke, please laugh. Okay, cool. I need you to please repeat after me. Rabenu! Sha'ag! That means Rebbe Nachman roared! Can we get a roar? Oh, that's good! Rabenu! Sha'ag! Bekol Gadol! That's great, you did part one. Let's try it again. And here's how the tune goes. Rabbeinu Sha'ag Bekol Gadol. Your turn, Rabbeinu Sha'ag Bekol Gadol. Break it down now. <laughs> okay. Kol Gadol again. Rabbeinu Sha'ag Bekol Gadol. Okay, the next words are Ain Shum Yeush. Ready? I picked up from the crowd that my tone was too high. <laughs> Let's try lower. Ain shum yeush. Ain shum yeush. Ain shum yeush. Ain shum yeush. Ba olam klal. If you have the paper, it'll help you. Ain shum yeush. that you just get totally Israeli, I can back up. Okay, we're gonna sing. You ready? Rabbeinu. I tricked you, I started too high. Rabbeinu. Sha'ag Bekol Hey! Hey! The next part you know. Ready? It goes... 
Rabbeinu, Rabbi Nachman is telling every single one of us, Will, he's telling you from the, Will, can you hear me? Will, Rabbi Nachman is telling you, <laughs> Rabbi Nachman is telling you that whatever has transpired in your life, you're not allowed to give up hope. You will rock that guitar again soon. Everybody say amen. amen. There's no giving up hope, and that's why Rabbi Nachman says it is a great mitzvah to be happy. So you guys think like, oh, Neely's up there. She had too much coffee, so she's happy. No. <laughs> yes. No. <laughs> the reason that I am coming to you with great happiness is not because I didn't cry today. Mazel tov, or yesterday, or the day before. It's because as we enter into this month, happiness is what's called an avoda if you're Ashkenazi, and avoda if you're Sephardi. What is avoda? Work. 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 Labor. Work. You gotta work it. Hashem is like, yo, homies, it's time to work it. Okay, so let me just set a precedent for the next hour and a half. We have to be in total quiet and connection and unity. Okay? More La yeah, more people could fit here if they want. Okay, we're going to try this song one more time. We're going to get into the teachings. But the reason I make us do a song is not just to open our hearts. It's also to get everyone involved, okay? The sheer is not for me. It's, it's, it's for every single one of us, okay? Here we go. Rabbeinu sha'ad bekol gadol. Here we go. Sheer here at the Yosian house, like 20 people came up to me afterwards. They're like, I am so sorry the crowd would not be quiet. I'm like, me too. <laughs> Let's not do that this time. Okay. Hashem, please give us such a beautiful night tonight. Please help us have these teachings pry open our hearts and let the deepest depths drop in to help us know we're not alone, Hashem. There's no such thing as despair. And I want everyone to please think for a moment right now about one thing that you're despairing on. Are you despairing about your body? Are you despairing about your health? Do I need to speak louder? Are you despairing about your love life? Are you despairing about your future? Are you dis what, Whatever you feel like you are despairing about, can everyone just raise your hand when you have it in your mind? Everyone's probably in despair about one thing or the next, right? Okay, so when you have it in your mind, I want you to now please take a minute and ask Hashem that by the end of this night, you're going to commit to letting go of that despair. Okay? Okay. 
thank yous, dedications, and we're going to dive in. As Jews, Yehudim, the center of our name is the word hod. It's thanks and gratitude. So that's where we'll start. First, I want to thank my dad. Everyone, round of applause for my dad. <laughs> Second, I want to thank Mishpachat Yossi and wherever you're at for hosting. <laughs> not only, not only is this the most epic house to have a class at, but the address is 613. <laughs> amazing and they didn't just host they provided food they provided so much so much amazing help we're so grateful to them Abby makes the flyers every week for this year okay and now uh, the team I need to thank Yaakov so much for picking up the host gifts Layla for the glitter and the henna Anna for the homentosh and oh my god there's homentosh and coming out soon Daniela for the balloons and something else that I can't read Roya for all of your help always Darren for bringing DJ Omri, the magical Balters, and Darren for bringing wine. Gabby, Nakama, Shannon. Amazing, guys. Give them a round of applause. Tamar, did I catch Tamar? Tamar? Guys, Tamar bought me this handy headset so that you could all hear. Oh, my gosh. Okay, we also want to thank Jody Sugar for the birth of her grandson, Dofer Ben Hanna Lisa. Um, It's really important to say thank you. So even though you're not necessarily learning something new, I, I need to thank these people. And you do too, because you're here, so just stay with me. Okay. We also want to ref wish a refua shlema to Chaya Bachana. We want to thank the Nekemeyers for their continued support. To Rachel and Avi again for your support. Uh, to Rafua Shlema for Maya Eliza Barachel and to Carol Berlin for Rafua Shlema of Tzivya Ora Baschana. Um, we also want to dedicate this year to the Aliyah Neshama of my precious mama and uh, to the Hashem, please bring peace with the situation in the Ukraine and Russia. We don't know what's going on, but we want peace. And we had a big Rafua Shlema for someone came up to me before. David ben For David Ben Zinat, it's your Abba, and we want your Abba to sing and dance at your wedding and with his grandchildren in perfect health. Every cell of his body should be happy. Everyone else, please take a minute, say the name to yourself or the person next to you. When we bring down Torah, we bring down a lot of light, right? So please, just think again in your head for a moment who you want to dedicate this learning to. Uh, I'll just start with the following. People have said, what? This is the last shear? You're moving back to Israel? And I said, no, we're all moving back to Israel. Don't be confused. So yes, right now I, I am putting a stop on the shears after a beautiful, amazing six months. And the reason is uh, because I want to be a role model, and I'll tell you why. Because when I've been doing the shear, I've been putting the shear as first priority in my life, and I ha haven't really attended to myself. So I'm actually stopping the shear so that I could put myself first. And I'm really proud of that. And so I, I thought that was important to share with you vulnerably because maybe there's something that all of us are putting first in our lives and maybe it's time. Look, this is amazing. I couldn't ask for a better opportunity, but it's still worth putting myself first. And so I also want to share that with you. Maybe there's something that's amazing in your life, but it's keeping you from yourself. So just an idea. We're going to start with a story. How do you guys like that? It's a really good story. Are you ready for it? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Hashem, I need help. All right, so there's a man, and his name is Pinchas. And with Pinchas, this is a true story. He lived in the 1800s. This is a very famous Purim story, but if you haven't heard it, it's worth hearing it again. So Rav Pinchas was a student of the Magid of Mezrich, a very famous Hasidic Rav, and one of the disciples of the Baal Shem Tov. Okay, so here's the thing. If anyone has seen what a Hasidic dynasty looks like, there is like this big Rebbe, and he has hundreds of Hasidim like this and like that, and these Hasidim, they come to the Rebbe every single Purim, and they bring him Mishloch Manot. Hey, Rebbe, you're going to be the Magid, okay? Okay. Okay, so you're the Rebbe, and I'm Pinchas, okay? Okay, ready? So here we go. Now there's a line. I need you. I need you. Come stand up. Quick, 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 quick. Come on, come on. 
you told your friends, right? Come on, come on, come on. <laughs> but it's their first time here, they're like, why? Okay, okay, so we're in line. Okay, be with a lot of joy and go give the Rebbe a Michelle Mano. <laughs> wow, Rebbe, appreciate it. <laughs> Amazing, it goes a lot of joy. Wow. <laughs> Okay, now I'm here, Pasa, right? You ready? Hi, Rebby. Uh, hi, uh, good morning, Rebby. Good morning. Uh, ask me, where's my Mishlach Manot? Where's the Mishlach Manot? Um, Rebby, I don't, um, I don't have Mishlach Manot for you this year. I'm a little bit broke. Okay, I'm not a little bit broke. I'm like a lot broke, and like I don't know, and like I can't even feed my kids, and I, my house is falling apart. And I just good porim. I just get to say good porim, okay? Good porim. So here's what happens. Rav Pinchas goes up to the Magid of Mezrich, and everyone comes with their great simcha, and he brings a bottle of wine, and he brings Zeke's new song that's out on Spotify, and he brings all these, and he brings you know a henna from Layla's station over there, and and. He, but he has nothing to bring this time. And so the Rebbe says to him, where's your Mishloch Manot? And he says, I'm poor, I don't have. And he says, well, why didn't you just go to the store and ask to borrow? He says, I went to the store and I said to them, please, I need wine to bring to my Rebbe. And they said, sorry, bro, good luck next time. And he's like, and I went to the bakery and I tried to get Amitash. I said, I don't have any money. Can I please have some Amitash for my Rebbe? And they said, get out of here. What are you, we're not gonna just give you home, Amitash? What do you think this is? So if Pinchas says to him, aha, you're in despair, huh? And what does Pinchas say? Yeah. Yeah. Never give up. Yeah. <laughs> Rebbe says, I can't. I just can't do it anymore. I'm not going to make it in this world. This sucks, you know? I don't even know what I'm going to do for Purim here in L.A. <laughs> All my friends are going to parties, but they're too expensive. <laughs> So he says to him, aha, aha, you know what the problem is? You know what the problem is, Daniel? The problem is that you don't know how to say good Purim, says the Rebbe. The Magid says to Rebbe Pinchas, and remember, this is a true story. He says, you don't know how to say good Purim. So he says, okay, Rebbe, good Purim. The Rebbe says, what? Try again. Good Purim! And Pinchas is like, okay, good Purim, Rebbe. He's like, no, no, no. Try again. Good Purim! And Pinchas goes, okay, good Purim. And the Rebbe goes, no, 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 good Purim! And Pinchas goes, okay, okay, good Purim! It's like, na, 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 ooh, na, na, na. <laughs> Try again. Good, good, good Purim! Imagine if you walked into your Purim party and you said, good Purim! They'd be like, what is she on, right? <laughs> no. And he says, that's not good enough. Try again. I'm telling you, Rapinchas, your problem is that you don't know how to say good Purim. Try again. And the Rebbe says, good Purim! And Rapinchas is like, good Purim! <laughs> and the Rebbe says, okay, yalla, now go get me Mishloch Manot. So Rapinchas, with a new excitement and new vigor, he gets up on his dad's shoulders and they're walking through the crowds and he goes into the wine store and he says, good Purim! I need a and the guy says, wow, Pinchas, what got into you? Sure, I take the wine, pay me later. He's like, thank you, good for him. And he goes to the baker and he says, I need hamantashen for my Rebbe. And the guy's like, Pinchas, what got into you? And he says, good for him. He says, good for him, here, take hamantashen. And he goes around store to store and he finds all this amazing stuff. And because of his new vigor, his new excitement in life, everybody's willing to give him. And he finally goes to the Rebbe and he bursts in the door and he says, good boy! Guys, now at this point you have to start doing it with me. And he says to the Rebbe, good boy! I mean, Very good. Amazing. And the Rebbe says, wow, you did it, Pinchas. Okay, now go home. And Pinchas is like, wait a second. I didn't get anything for my family, my seven children, my wife. They're sitting, what am I going to do? He says, keep it up. And he goes back and he walks into the grocery store and he says, good for him. And the grocery store owner's like, Pinchas, good, good for him. He's good for him. He says, good for him. And, and the, the grocery store is like, oh gosh. What's up? He's like, I need a box full of your best, and I need a dress for my wife, 
and I need amazing clothes for my kids. And the guy's like, okay, okay, uh, pay me later, cool. Packs it up, goes home, and for the first time in like 20 years, he doesn't walk into his house like a holy schlepper. He doesn't come home and say, hey, honey, hey, hey guys, uh, yeah, cool. Uh, I don't know, what are we going to eat? I don't know. For the first time in 20 years, now imagine this in the house that you... Mazel tov. Imagine this in the house that you grew up in, or perhaps the house that you're in now, or perhaps the relationship that you're in now. Imagine, instead of coming home and saying, hey, babe, I'm home, you walk in and you say, good boy! And you say, good boy! <laughs> your spouse, your kids, they'll be like, wow, what happened to you? And you just say, I learned that we can never, ever give up hope. There's no such thing as despair. Roya, never, ever give up hope. <laughs> and the most amazing thing happened. When he went to the Magi, to his Rebbe, and he told him that he made this change, the Rebbe says to Pinchas, the Rebbe says to Pinchas, this is my dramatic effect for people to get quiet, the Rebbe says to Pinchas, Pinchas, I, bre I bless you. I bless you. I bless you. <laughs> I bless you with the strength of Purim. And what happened is in the 1800s, Pinchas was a real Rebbe, and he got so wealthy that he became the financier of three of the greatest dynasties. It was the seer of Lublin, the Magid of Kojitz, and Rav Mendel of Riminov used to have thousands of people at their Shabbat table. And who do you think became their financier? Rav Pinchas. And the teaching here, says Rav Shlomo Karlibach, is this is what Purim can do to a person. If you are a person who has experienced despair, and that's all of us, and you want to walk into your house or into your job, or you want to call your girlfriend or boyfriend, or it's just like lame with your spouse lately, and it's just like, oh, problems, problems, we're always fighting. Fine. Let Purim change you. When you go home tonight or when you come in tomorrow, have the courage to test this out and walk into your door exclaiming something with joy. Walk in and say, honey, I love you. You're beautiful. And I swear, I can't swear, but if I could swear, I would swear <laughs> that that night everything will be different in your house. Do it with a Persian <laughs> Do it with a Persian accent? <laughs> Tell me how to say it in Farsi. <laughs> no, give me a <laughs> How you doing? Honey, I love you. Girl, you're Persian, and I got a Persian, I got a better accent than you. Honey, I love you. <laughs> serious very serious and then so this is this is an actual true story and you can see now why God gives us Purim God does not give us Purim because it's a children's holiday God does not give us Purim because one day in 2022 there'd be a woman named Neely who loves costumes God gives us Purim so that we can completely revamp and let go of our despair one time a year raise your hand please if you think you walk if you okay if you live with people Raise your hand if you think you walked into your house and you exclaimed something with ultimate joy if you also believe that it would change the vibe in your house. And I dare you to try it. And I tell you why I dare you. Because Purim, as Rachel was... Is it Rachel or Rachel? I still don't know. It's Rachel, sorry. Rachel was saying in her shiur this week that Simcha poretz geder. Simcha helps us break through. You cannot... Okay, listen. If you've been depressed lately... And that's most of us. Yes. Don't assume. Don't assume? All right, you can hang out with DJ Omri if you want the good vibes. <laughs> but if you're anything like me, <laughs> and you've been feeling down, it doesn't change on its own. It changes because we change it. It changes because we walk in and we exclaim, Good morning! Beautiful. Okay, so let's go. The truth is we're not really going to get to the Parsha, but I will tell you what it is. So that you know, it's Parshat Vayikra. What is it? Vayikra. Awesome. Parshat Vayikra. Va we're Vayikra. actually Vayikra. Vayikra. Oh my gosh, you have the same color nails. Oh, oh yeah. I love that. That's awesome. 
I actually did it to match my shoes. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. So here's the thing. Um, we're not going to talk about Vaikra, but I do want to mention that we're starting a new book of the Bible. New equals newness. Judaism is all about newness. Because you know what despair says? Everything's going to be the same as it was. You know what newness says? Maybe this time it'll be different. Everything is new. We're starting a new book with the book of Vai. Yeah. Awesome. You guys are awesome. And I want to share a little Torah that Reb David Sachs says. Guys, I can't tell my dynamic. Do I need to be louder? No. My handy Madonna microphone is working epic. Yeah. Yeah. Every time I see myself on Facebook Live, I want to do gymnastics. <laughs> I need some more spandex. Okay, so Reb David Sachs said something incredible at a Shi'or this week. He said last week we came out of the teachings of Piku Day. And Piku Day has, this is the, the end of the last book. <clears throat> And what he says is that Piku Dei has the shorish of the word pakad. This is a bit of an advanced teaching, so if you haven't learned much Torah, just let yourself chill for a minute and zone back in in a second. Pakad is the secret of redemption. When the Mashiach comes, he will reveal to us that he is here by using the phrase pakod pakadati. And what this means is that l'chaim, I love all the scares. It's like kind of get everyone to like shake it up, you know? It's great. So Silv, check this out. Pikude was the last parsha of the last book. It's at the end. And you know what God says? Pikude means, I'm going to remember you. I remembered you. I didn't forget. So if David Sachs on Saturday morning said, when you feel like you're at the end, it is only because you think God forgot about you. We need to re-remember that at the end of times, when we're at the lowest of the low, we think God has completely forgotten about us, and everyone else's life is awesome, and everybody else's marriage is perfect, and everybody else is thriving financially, and you think you're all alone, and it's the end? Hashem didn't forget about you. And that's very, very important. Piku Dei was the end. In other words, when you come to an end, you must remember God did not forget about you. Can we open our hearts to that idea? It's true. He didn't. Okay. So now, I, what are we going to do tonight is we're going to... Oh, and let me just tell you something for your comfort. I want the new form of peer pressure to be, I peer pressure you to do whatever is best for you. Okay? So I'm going to stand here and I'm going to talk, talk, talk. And then we got DJ Omri afterwards. Okay? We're going strong tonight. Someone's going to need a strong Starbucks in the morning. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. Just go when you need to go. Okay? It's okay if there's 10 of us here at the end. I don't mind. I want to do what's best for you, but I also want to do what's best for me, which is to talk as long as I need. Cool? Yeah. So everyone can feel free and comfortable tonight. Awesome. So what we're going to do is we're going to go practically. This is a spiritual preparation class, but it's very hard to get spiritually prepared when you don't know what the heck is happening in the practical. So we're going to do the practical and the spiritual, okay? And we're going to do it in the order of it's happening. Thumbs up if that sounds good to you. Yeah. Oh, who said, oh, yeah, you're my favorite person. Oh, it's a Yosian. <laughs> All right, so what's happening first is this Shabbat, and this Shabbat is Parshat? Vayikra. This Shabbat is Parshat? Vayikra. They thought they could get away with it by standing in the back. <laughs> okay, but this Shabbat is not just Vayikra, it's also Shabbat Zahor. Does anyone know what Zahor means? Wow, you guys are awesome. What are we remembering? It's a big irony. Has anyone seen my shoes? <laughs> When I, when I was a little girl, we, w we didn't grow up religious. In fact, my parents grew up with Christmas trees, okay? So them taking us to a conservative synagogue, they were like super Jews, you know? But we didn't know very much, and my brother started to become religious before me, and he told me about this idea that on Parshat Zahor, we read about how we're supposed to remember that we're supposed to forget Amalek, and that apparently we're supposed to step on Amalek, and I'll tell you what Amalek is in a minute if you're confused, so don't worry. And as a little girl, I thought, wow, I'm supposed to step on Amalek? So I took a marker and I wrote Amalek on the bottom of all of my shoes. <laughs> and then I showed my brother and he just started laughing. He's like, that's not what it means. But I thought I'll do it again tonight. So if anyone wants, you can take a Sharpie and we'll all write Amalek on our feet. What is Amalek? Does anyone want to share? What is Amalek? 
Our enemy. Why? Why is Amalek our enemy? Who is Amalek anyways? What is this Amalek business? Uh, Yetzir Hara, evil king. What else we got? Who is Amalek? A dictator. Whoa, you're on fire. Okay. What else we got? What is Amalek? Amalek was a nation. Okay. Amalek was a nation that descended from the children of Esav. Okay. Esav, whose brother is Esav? Whenever I forget, I ask you. <laughs> you know, it's hard to get all the twin sets together sometimes. Esav, you smell like. So, who is Esav's brother? <laughs> Thanks, I forgot. <laughs> Isn't that a good trick? <laughs> okay, so Esau has Eliphaz, Eliphaz has Amalek, and Amalek has a very evil descendant. I'm going to give you a hint. When we hear the name of this descendant, we say, Boo! Come on, what's your name? Hey, Jill. Yeah. Hey, Jill, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Jill. You're the best. Okay. And listen, it's very hard for me that I haven't met everybody in this room. When the classes were smaller, it was really um, wonderful for me to get to know everybody. So if we haven't met tonight, hi, I'm Neely. And please uh, feel free to like come over and wave hi afterwards. So I'd love to just know what precious souls we are here learning together. My rabbi in Israel, don't worry, I have ADD. I will get back to the cards. My <laughs> rabbi in Israel said, and I say this every year because it's like my favorite teaching, that nothing is random and souls travel together. So when God created the universe 6,000 years ago, he knew that on March 7, 2022, all of us, he would bring all of us. And I appreciate that. Okay, so here's the thing. Amalek, what they did to us is as we were leaving Egypt, right as God splits the sea. I mean, it's like as if God took Beverly Drive, opened it up, put like a Venice Canal with crystal water and boats. It's like, all right, people have fun. Go leave Beverly Hills. And we're like, woo! Awesome. This amazing miracle happens, and then all of a sudden you get to like a uh, Olympic Boulevard, and there's like uh, warriors with knives ready to attack you. Like, are you dumb? Did you not just see that God opened the streets for me and made a miracle? And Amalek is like, we don't care about your miracles. We don't care about your faith. We don't even care if we're gonna get wiped out. We want you to go down. So who's Amalek today for us? Because believe it or not, raise your hand. 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 Everyone, raise your hand, please. Please, please. Group participation, everyone raise your hand. You snuggle with Amalek every night. Oh. <laughs> uh-huh. And you thought you were all alone. You snuggle with Amalek every night. You you drink Amalek in your coffee. Do you know what the gematria of Amalek is? What is the numerical value equivalent to a special word? Where's Yaakov? Yaakov knows. There's like seven Yaakovs, that's not nice. <laughs> Is it? I don't know, I didn't do the math. <laughs> but I'll tell you what it is equivalent to. It is equivalent to the word suffek. Does anyone know what suffek means? No. Doubt. What does doubt mean? What did I say that we were here to discuss tonight? Pinchas, first he went to go get groceries. like, I'm sorry, I just need some home and tosh. And they're like, get out of here. He walks in and he says, I need home and tosh. And they're like, that's what's up. Amalek is doubt. Every one of us has cuddled up with the presence of doubt in ourselves, self-doubt. I won't make it. I don't know what I'm doing. How do I advance in the future? What do I do with my relationships? I'm not good enough. All of us are snuggling with doubt at night. We have doubt in our coffee. We don't even know if we can make it through the day. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Can you ask it really loud? Yeah. Um, isn't it like possible for some doubt to like if you're like totally certain everything you're doing is... Great question. The question from the crowd, from Lore Lore, Holy Lore Lore, was, isn't some doubt healthy? Um, on one foot, I don't know, and on another foot, what I would say is, in ourselves, zero self-doubt, full confidence. Doesn't mean we shouldn't be humble. Doesn't mean we can't surrender to God and what's going to be. But I, if you're asking me now without thinking about it, I would say, heck no, no self-doubt, no doubt ever. And why? Because we are commanded to stomp out Amalek. We're commanded to destroy doubt. I have a question for you. What, what, okay, I see so many people on your phones. I know this is so exciting, but it's so distracting for me. Guys, if I asked you, beautiful lady in the orangey ready dress, what would be possible for you 
If all of your self-doubt, oh God, I embarrassed you. Now I should no, give you breath. I don't know who I am because you don't recognize me with the wig, but I'm good. I'll be the lady in the orange dress right now. Yes. What's the question? <laughs> oh good, we embarrassed each other right back. <laughs> the question is, um, <laughs> you thought you were coming for toy. It's comedy. <laughs> that Ariella under there? Oh, I just said Ariella. Did you not hear me? I saved myself. No, I've never seen you in a shape. Oh, give up. That's awesome. What would be possible for you if self-doubt was eliminated? Okay, get some more answers. Her creativity, what would be possible for you if your self-doubt was, was vanquished, wiped out? Clo, clo. Yeah, yeah. It's a setup because your self-doubt already went out the window like last year. Oh, wow. Chloe took her self-doubt and squashed it into the ground about a year ago. She's like, no more for me. What's, what's possible when self-doubt goes away? Uh, no fear. No fear. No fear. What, who, I need more answers. What would happen? What would be made possible if all of your self-doubt went out the window? My business would, my business would blow up. Your business would blow up. Can you hear that son? You would be limitless. Can you hear that son? Like all the great Sadiqim. What, you think, you think Abraham was like, I don't know if I could do this, God. He's like, all right, Hineni, I'm here. All the greats, they didn't say I can't. They said Hineni, here I am. Who, Shannon, you have an answer? Everything would be possible if you didn't have self-doubt? Can you hear your own? Who? Shana, has Shana. I want to hear your answer. It's something that I've not been Shout, please. It's something that I've been struggling with recently. Okay. Picking a career, like a job. And, and if there was no self-doubt, then what? I think I could pick in like two seconds. Oh. Nice. Guys, sprinkle her with some self-doubt <laughs> annihilation. Yeah. Rana, what would be possible for you if self-doubt was disappeared? Gone. No more Amalek. You don't have to answer. That's Rona. She's my friend from kindergarten. Yeah. True story. Yeah, kindergarten through 12th grade, let's be real. And we reunited a couple weeks ago when she hosted a sheer. How cool is that? After 20 years. Sorry, I revealed our age. I don't care. Yes, Mara. Success. Success. Success in whatever you want. So success, motivation, possibility, all success. Growth, yes. Was there, uh, Roya, Daniela, was, was there an excitement over there? Emmet, truth would be possible? I love it. Okay, great. So we're starting to understand. I brought you here tonight not to entertain. Yes, to entertain. That's totally a lie. I totally want to entertain you. But because we have to know how we walk into Purim. Purim is not just about your costume. The costumes are cute. They're also very deep. We're going to discuss it tonight. But the idea is, as you're approaching Purim, this is not a kid's holiday. This is the most profound holiday of the entire year. Hashem gives us one day to say, Hashem, take away all of my insecurity. Take away all of my self-doubt. I want self-confidence and I want self-value. And I'll share with you a very cool teaching. There is a difference between self-confidence and self-value. Self-confidence... Self-esteem, listen to this, this, is a fantastic psychological insight. Self-confidence and self-esteem are what you're willing to say yes to. So Shmuel, if I'm like, will you say an answer at my shear, and you say yes, that means you have self-esteem and self-confidence. Self-value, this could be the most valuable insight of the night, is what you're willing to say no to. Okay, so just keep those in mind as we study. So Amalek... Yes, self-confidence and self-esteem are what you're willing to say yes to. Someone offers you an invitation, a job, they ask you out on a date. Uh, yes, self-value is what you're willing to say no to. Someone treating you a certain way, someone asking you a question in an aggressive way. You're allowed to say no if you have value because it's like if someone approaches the queen and they're like, excuse me, get I want out of my way, she'd be like, no. Not for a moment. You know, back off, biatch. <laughs> you know, so that's self-value. Of course, you could do it nicely. And pardon my language, it was trying to be funny. So here's the thing. Amalek is internalized self-hatred. And like we said, if you get to Purim and you're hating on yourself and you're doubting yourself, can you really have that much fun? No. No. We have to believe in ourselves. We have to be Pinchas. Good Purim. Amalek is internalized self-hatred. And Amalek says... Shmot 1716, 
Check this out. For there is a hand upon the throne of God, a war of God with Amalek from generation to generation. What this means is that Amalek doesn't disappear until Mashiach comes. That means, like we said, Amalek is snuggling with you. But here's the good news, my friends. Amalek is the greatest liar of all time. What do we say Rabbi Nachman said? He said, there's no despair. There's absolutely no despair. Despair is a complete and a total lie. If you think you're stuck, if you think it's the end, if you think it's your apocalypse, you're wrong. The snake is lying to you. Amalek comes from the powers of the snake, the Nachash in the Garden of Eden. You know why the snake's a liar? Very obvious. The same way that carrots are good for your eyes if you cut them. And broccoli's good for your brain because it looks like your brain. And tomatoes with four chambers are good for your heart. Right? This is not random. And exactly what I'm saying, how do you know the snake's a liar? His tongue literally splits in two directions. That's not a random design by God. <laughs> okay? Yeah, that's a wow. The snake is the inherent liar. And the snake is the power of Amalek. And it lies to you. And it says, for you, Yaakov, there's no hope. That's it. Fabian, forget it. Forget it. Kenny, give it up right now. Candy? Oh, I don't know. Oh, no, Kenny. Oh, not Candy. <laughs> so why is Amalek lying, my friends? Why is my beautiful friends? Zeke, why is Amalek lying when it tells you you can't win the Grammy? God forbid. Why would it be lying to you? Why? You know why it's lying necessarily? And I'll tell you this answer is really profound. The reason that you know that anything that gives you self-doubt is lying? Ready? Guys, I've got really good news. I don't just have really good news. I have the best news ever. You ready for this? This is like mind blow number two. If self-value and self-confidence didn't blow you away, if giving up despair as a lie didn't blow you away, here's the secret. We've already won. The battle is won. Mashiach is coming. It's not like, oh, maybe it will come. So let me like go get a coffee on Rodeo. No, guys. <laughs> History has already been mapped out. Hashem already made his promise to us. The messianic era will come. That means no more war with others, within ourselves. No more sadness. We've already won. You can pause right now and be like, holy crunk, that's the best news ever. Yeah. Yeah. Amalek is lying because whatever says we won't succeed, we will not win, we won't be victorious, truth will not prevail, is a lie. And if it's a lie collectively, it's a lie in your life as well. And the question is, who do you want to believe, the snake or God? So if you want to start believing God, you could start celebrating because there's hope for every single one of us and there's hope for the world. And the truth is, it's what we've already won. Have you ever thought about that? The war is won. The fight has won. And guess who wins? Guess who wins? Yeah, holiness. Anybody who is aligned with holiness and God, we won. That's a relief. All right, so this week, coming up, I told you we're going to progressively go through everything, right? So we said that this week, Shabbos is Parshat Zahor. We remember that we have to wipe out... I need to do some yoga. That was hard. <laughs> I'm like, hold on, I've got this. <laughs> oh, like, that's like that move from the 1980s, right? I didn't ever get why that was a move, but... <laughs> okay, so we Parshat... We, we, so what's the Shabbos? Is Parshat... Vayikra, I tricked you. Parshat Vayikra, and it's also called Parshat... Because we're supposed to... Remember to... Amalek, which is... Self-doubt and self-hatred. Now listen, I know this is simple as can be, but I'm really blessing, and don't worry, there's a lot more. I'm really blessing all of us to go home tonight asking ourselves, what if I really prepared for Purim the way I prepared for every other holiday? What if, I mean, I'm serious, like, what if you showed up at your Seder and you started to clean then? You'd have a problem, right? What if you showed up at Yom Kippur and you hadn't asked anyone for a, an apology? You'd have a problem, right? Yes. So don't think Purim is any different. We've just lost the tradition in the West. It's time to prepare for Purim right now. Good and to Purim! Good Purim! Purim! Your head looks amazing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Last night, two nights ago, you were gushing blood. Now you look fantastic. <laughs> Go 
to you. Unfortunately, it didn't stop you because you already believe in Purim. Okay, so this Shabbos is Parsha Vaikra. It's Shabbat Zachor. We wipe it out, and then as the week flows, Purim is going to be. Everybody know the date of Purim. It's next Wednesday, Wednesday night and Thursday. Okay. So, is it? That's funny. Okay. So here's the thing. Right before Purim, on Wednesday, we have a very interesting custom. Does anyone know what it is? Fast day, the fast of Esther. So let's review. Today we're in Parsha Vaikra. As we approach Shabbos, we'll be Parsha Vaikra. We'll be Shabbat Zachor. We get out of Shabbos. This ring leaves in the corner. <laughs> we are, usually I can rag on the Persians, not the Israelis. Okay. We get out of Shabbos, we enter into the week, and then unfortunately or fortunately, whatever your perspective is, we have to fast. Why do we fast? Megillah's a great answer. That's a great way out of it. Who said Megillah? Good one. Oh, that's sneaky. Why do we fast? Team, what? Team Esther. Team Esther. What does that mean? Why are we fasting? Because of Esther? Because Esther said, when the Jews were about to be annihilated, Esther said, Mordechai, go gather all the Jews and get them to fast for me. Get them to what? Do tshuva. What is tshuva? Now tell me something. Ready for this psychological insight? This is another mind blow. Every single person in this room, when you've had a bout of depression or upset, do you know what you said to the people that you love? Ready for this? This is another mind blow. No, you didn't say I'm okay. Oh, you're from LA. Uh huh. How are you going? Great, thanks. Fine. <laughs> I got my nails did. <laughs> I love all the knowing laughter in L.A., right? <laughs> I'm great. I posted on Instagram. I went to another club. I feel fabulous. <laughs> Shoot, what was I going to say? Oh, okay. Because when you feel terrible, the sentence that everyone says to the people they love is... Natan, you ready for this? I don't feel like myself. You know what that means? that the depressive, sad, upset, lonely part of you, it's not you. And everybody here knows that. You might think, oh no, this is my natural state. This is because I'm so traumatized because of the way that I grew up or you don't even know how bad my life is. No, the truest state of you is the one that says, I don't feel like myself because myself is a good place. For, can anyone disagree with me? Has everyone said, I don't feel like myself? Tal, have you said this? Yes. I don't feel like myself because myself... I don't feel like myself all the time. But today I feel like That's what's up! <laughs> and so when Esther... She, uh, she said something great, but we're going to keep going. She, and when Esther says, please fast for me, we fast in order to do tshuva. Tshuva, as we know, is not oh, Hashem. It's Hashem, please return me to myself. Tashuv, hey, return me to the Hashem in me, to the godliness, to the joy. Help me return to myself. So on the fast of Esther, you're not just supposed to fast because God's like, you're eating too much food, you Jews. <laughs> we're supposed to fast to do tshuva, and we're supposed to fast just to say, have a day of reflection and say, listen, tomorrow's Purim, that will be on the fast of Esther, and I want to be happy, so Hashem, help me feel like myself again. That's what you're supposed to say to yourself on Wednesday. Help me feel like myself. Are you going to play nice melodies in the background? Turn again. Sweet. <laughs> no, but you can play that in the back. Okay. So, how are we doing, guys? <laughs> how, what time is it? 9.30. 9.30? Okay. okay, I'm going to go for a half hour more. I'm going to skip half the cards, but I'm going to go for a half hour more. I'll go for longer. You know. Bro. Notice how that was three people in the crowd. <laughs> the rest are parents, right? All right, so here's the thing. I told you we're preparing technically. This Shabbat is Shabbat. The more, and the Parsha is. And you come out and it's Wednesday and it's time to do tshuva to return to myself because it's the fast of Esther. Because Esther said fast for me, do tshuva, return to who you are, and right after that, we have something we really have to take care of, but the truth is it's out of order. Costumes. The idea of a costume is not because your kids get dressed up. This is an amazing, can you show us your costume? It's so good. Would you really? Come up, come up to the screen. 
come up to the screen. Like, this is amazing because this sweet princess right here, she knows that she really is a princess. The rest of us, wait, come up, quick, 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 forget to the shoes, yeah. A round of applause. Oh my goodness. Do you want to tell them who you are? Do you want to tell them who you are? No? You did great. Round of applause. So listen, costumes are amazing for kids, but if you don't wear a costume this year, I'm telling you, you're missing out. This is an avodah. This is the spiritual work. God is not like, ha ha, let's have something like Halloween so the Jews in LA don't feel left out. No, that's not what it is. Your costume is supposed to be an expression or a manifestation of either your dreams for this coming year or something that you would never let yourself be. So I have a hippie sister-in-law who always wears like really baggy, flowy clothes. On Purim, she always dresses up in like high heels with like a wig and fancy stuff because she'll never let herself be like that. So she does the opposite. I want to tell you a truth in my life. Every single year, the costume that I wear for Purim manifests into my life in exactly what the costume was. And we get really vulnerable with you. Is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> Can I reveal that I'm not perfect and shining and happy all the time? No. So when I had to choose a divorce, oh, she said it, oh my gosh, yeah, me and like 60% of the people in this room, okay. <laughs> when I had to choose divorce, I was married to a really sweet, wonderful tzaddik of a man, okay, so no lashin hara there, but what I will say is that I knew I needed to do it, and I was scared as heck. I was scared what people would think of me. I was scared of everything. I was scared, will I ever, this, that, all the fears you could dream of. And I really needed courage. And so what did I dress up on Purim? As courage. I dressed up on Purim as courage, and I prayed all of Purim, and I got the strength and the fortitude to approach him like a mensch. I'll give myself credit and say we need to, it needs to be over, right? I needed courage, and Hashem gave me courage. The next year, I decided that I was being such a light chaser. Everything was wonderful and happy, but I was avoiding my dark side, so I dressed up as the darkness, as integration. And the entire next year, I spent doing shadow work. I'm not going to tell you what my costume is this year, because you have to come hang out. But I'm really encouraging you to work on... Oh, I talk? oh my God, if you stay to the end of this year, I will tell you. It's amazing. It's amazing. Ask my dad, right? My dad does not have room in his closet because my Purim costume... The reason I'm here in LA for Purim is because I can't fit my Purim costume into a suitcase to take you back to Israel. Did this go off? No. Okay, so I invite you right now. Do not wait. Do not show up at your Passover Seder and start to clean for Passover. Start now. Plan your costumes now. It doesn't have to be elaborate. In fact, I wore this as a costume tonight because I was at the Ben Yehuda's house. And um, Leah and her husband were talking about Azamra, which is an idea from Ebi Nachman to find the point of goodness in everything. So I actually went out and bought this because there were points on it, and I want to manifest this idea of looking the good in everything. So I got something with points. So you just need a jacket, but you just take whatever, and don't think you're exempt. Whoever's sitting here going, yeah, yeah, that's cute, she's telling adults to wear costumes. This is the work. Purim is spiritual work. I invite you to start getting your costume ready now. Now, I want to tell you also that this Purim is the highest day of the year for prayer. If you need to pray about anything, especially eradicating self-doubt, Purim is the day. We're going to go through quickly the four mitzvahs of the day of Purim, okay? Because there's four mitzvahs. Everyone's doing good? Yes. Do we need like a celebrate good times break? Seven, there's a party going. I just keep wanting to do it. <laughs> All right. Do you know that my dream as a kid was, this is my dream. Before I knew what Broadway was, I was like, I just want to be a bar and bat mitzvah dancer. <laughs> you know this, the hype people? I thought they were so cool. <laughs> okay, there are four mitzvahs on Purim that you have to do. Do you want to know what they are? They all begin with the letter M. We have, repeat after me, Megillah, Megillah. Meal, Meal. Mishloach Manot, Matanot Le'evyonim. These, this is the work of Purim, okay? We're just going to quickly go through, I'm going to tell you what you do on Purim day. Ah, first Purim night, okay? Listen, we have it all wrong. I'm just going to be really frank with you. 
Purim night is, meant, is not meant to be a big party at all. The Hasidim, what they do on Purim night, they hear the Megillah and they go to bed. Why? So they could wake up and have koach for the next day because the strength of Purim comes out on the day. Okay? So if you more really want to use Purim for your partying, great. Go to bed and use the day as your party. Okay? Purim night, you're just meant to hear the Megillah, go to sleep. Fine. You do have to hear the Megillah twice. There are no exemptions. Man, woman, and children. We have to hear the entire Megillah, and I'll tell you why in a minute. You have to hear every single word of the Megillah. And the reason is, according to Rib Shlomo, that God hid every single secret of the universe in the Megillah. When you hear the Megillah, you're hearing the secret to your entire life. You're hearing the story of your life. So that's why, on a given week, if you go to synagogue, you go to shul, and you're schmoozing with your neighbor, hey, how's uh, that? Aaron. Was, what? Aaron. Aaron. Yeah, I'm like, Aaron, how's it going? Um, and, and let's say we're talking during the Torah reading and we miss a few words. It's sad. But do I have to go hear the Torah reading again? I have to go now from the Happy Minion to Beth Jacob to Yik? No, I, I don't. It's cute. Like, great, you should learn the Torah. But if you miss a word, it's okay. If you miss one word of the Megillah, what do you have to do? You have to hear it again. Now, what if you sneeze? What if you're in the Megillah reading and you sneeze and you miss a word? That's why we read the Megillah when, with the reader, okay? When you, show up to Meg when you show up to hear Megillah, please make sure you have a copy of the Megillah with you. You can download it online. It's in the back of the Art Scroll Homage, or your synagogue might have it. But you really want to follow along with the words because why? God is giving you the story of your life. So you really want to hear every single word of the Megillah, okay? Now, the meal. The meal is set up in the daytime. It's really important to have a meal. Why is God so obsessed with us having a meal on Purim? There's a meal on every holiday. Good answer. Yeah. Say what? Because why? He knows we're Jewish. He knows we're Jewish, right? We like eating, right? What? Because what? Because we fasted, that's true, but that would really stink if we ate the meal the next day and we fasted the day before. <laughs> the strength to celebrate? We need that cholent to give us the, the vibes? Okay, yeah? Oh? Uh -huh. say, say good, say better, say loud? We sin by eating at the meal. Hold on, very good. Did you have an answer back here that I didn't hear? Yeah, you won't. So you won't forget it? Okay, yeah, Sasha is Harrison. the holy winner tonight. Give Sasha a round of applause. Okay. What does he mean? What does he mean that we sin by eating at the meal? Yes? Dave. 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 I did that for my nephew. He always cheers when Dave walks in. Banquet? What banquet? What are you even talking about, banquet? Ahasuerus? What are you talking about? Banquet and all? Okay, let's get some history going here, my friends. Yeah. What happened on Purim? Where did Purim take place? <gasps> Terangelis! Iran! <laughs> Finally, the Persians get their holiday. Okay, I'm so sorry, Facebook. It's been crooked the whole time. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Good Purim. <laughs> Okay. Go Persians. We love the Persians. We love the Persians. Lo I love Persians. <laughs> I do. Every time I like swear I'm not going to make Persian jokes, but I just love Persians. They're so good. I freaking love the Persians. <laughs> so here's the thing. Purim happens in Iran. I feel so arrogant when I'm around someone and they're like, Iran, and I'm like, you mean Iran? <laughs> yes. Iran? What the heck? <laughs> right. Okay. So here's the thing. Purim happens because the temple was destroyed. And there was a prophecy that said that in the 70th year after the destruction of the temple, that the temple would be rebuilt. Now, Ahasuerus, the ruler in Iran, is like, ha, 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 ha. your temple's not being rebuilt. Let's party. The reason Ahasuerus had these famous 180-day parties was because he thought it was already the 70th year he had miscalculated. It was the 69th. And he saw the temple was not being rebuilt in Jerusalem, and he's like, yeah, down with God. This is awesome. Now, Ahasuerus had the stolen goods of the temple. 
He had the kalim, the, the vessels from the temple, the golden vessels. He had the clothes of the Kohen Gadol. And Achashverosh invites all the Jews and all the people to get wasted for 180 days. 180 days of complete debauchery. And, sorry to say it, but orgiastic behavior. And just completely out of their minds, drunk for 180 days. That's like half the, more than half the year. Wasted. What's going on? The Jews came to the party. Do you understand what's happening? The Jews came to the party that was celebrating the fact that the temple was not rebuilt. Did they know? <laughs> well, I think they certainly knew when they walked in and saw a Hashveros dressed like the Kohen. Uh, the celebration of a Hashveros, we weren't just punished because, oh, Jews want a party. No, we were celebrating the demise of the temple. And so, we eat a meal to rectify the meal of a Hashveros. And this is why you got to be careful on Purim, because you have to lose your mind, but you have to keep it together that you don't just commit the same sins and the same debauchery that we committed back then. It's very tricky for him. You have to go out of your mind drunk. Okay, and if you can't drink, or if you don't drink, that's cool. you got to get drunk on love, says Rip Shlomo. You have to get drunk on love. Don't think you're exempt. Like, if you can't drink, mad respect. Everybody knows their boundaries. If drinking is not for you, don't do it. Please, don't take this as like a Neely's telling me to drink. Don't drink if drinking isn't good for you or your family. Right? Note to the husbands. Before you get wasted, make sure your wife has everything she needs. <laughs> Women, before your man gets wasted or before you get wasted, make sure he has everything he needs. Make sure the babysitter's in order. It's not a joke. Because Purim can make a lot of Shalom Bayit problems if you don't communicate first. And dear women... Every woman thinks their man is a total idiot on Purim. It's okay. Just love him anyways. <laughs> You're not alone. Your husband is not the worst drunk. Every husband is the worst drunk. I, I mean this to say this very genuinely because I've had a lot of friends crying in my house at the end of Purim because their husband's barfing in the toilet. <laughs> it's okay. Let him barf. Let him do his holy work. But don't think... <laughs> I'm serious, but make sure, make sure the night before that you've communicated so you can already let him off the hook first. Or men, make sure you've communicated with your girlfriend so she's not feeling alone and sad. It's very important, Shalom Bayit on Purim. Yes, question. He was sneaky good to the Jewish people. He was sneaky good. Come, I have kosher food for you. I can't make the toddy joke, I make it every week. I got toddy! Kebab, gourmet sabzi! All kosher! I made for you, special for you! He made special kosher food for them. But listen, I want you to reflect, please. It's Lisa, right? You said? Jill. Jill. Lisa, Jill. That's, that's a Barnett joke, Dad. That was total. Um, ask me your question again, please. No, I thought he was. He was good to the Jews. So the question I want to ask you is where are we celebrating the demise of our culture by excusing it as Western behavior? Because we are. No, I agree, but I just Yes, yes, you know, you, you are correct. He was good to the Jews in some ways, but it was a behind the back way. It was a calm, assimilate way. Okay, so here's the thing. The meal on Purim is there to fix the meal of Achashverosh. And what was the problem of Achashverosh? Let's take it all the way back to the beginning, what we were saying. There's no despair. What was Achashverosh saying? Despair! Give up hope! You're never going to have a temple again! Does anyone here actually believe Mashiach is coming and we're going to have another temple? Yeah. It's true. It's true. But the truth is everybody who was quiet is like, ah, I don't know if that's going to happen. I don't know if that's going to happen. A lot of people feel, I don't know. I don't know if it's going to happen. The, the meal is supposed to help us reaffirm our beliefs in ourselves and in the world. We said never give up hope. You know why? If there's hope for you, there's hope for the world. So the meal is about the same thing, reinvigorating hope in yourself. Okay, Mishloch Manot. Mishloch Manot is the third mitzvah. What is Mishloch Manot? Third. No, very good, the third mitzvah. What is Mishloch Manot? <laughs> gifts. We give two gifts to two people. That's all you need. You don't have to make yourself crazy. Two gifts with two brachot. And you can give a banana and a cookie. 
Okay? The idea of Mishloch Manot is, I believe in you. I believe in your goodness. And I want you to have good. The whole point of Purim is not giving up hope on yourself, is wiping out doubt. But if you really believe you can wipe out doubt for yourself, then you have to believe that I believe you can succeed too. And I give you gifts to say, I believe in your success. When you're giving Mishloch Manot, it's not about who could buy the fanciest wine and the biggest package for your neighbors. Mishloch Manot is saying, I believe in you and I want your good, so I'm going to give you something of my own. Wow. Is that a different take on Mishloch Manot for you? Yeah. The whole point of Mishloch Manot is I believe in you also. Matanot la Evyonim, that's number four. What's Matanot la Evyonim? Sedaka, how much money do you need to give to the poor on Purim? Sasha! The amount of money you're supposed to give to the poor on Purim is enough to buy them a meal. You have to give two gifts and you have to give it on Purim itself. You cannot give your gifts now. On Purim, before you start drinking, before you go to Shul, what you do is you get on the computer and you give. It's so easy. You arrange your charity in advance so you know who to give to, okay? Why do we give, mish- why do we give Matanot Levionim? Avas Israel. that's good. What does that mean? Loving each other, that's exactly what Purim is about, yeah? Do you give the gifts Wednesday night or Thursday night? Thursday day, these are all day mitzvot. Let's say what the four again are. The m- Megillah, the... That was amazing. Let's do that again. The four things that we're going to do on Thursday coming are... All right, here's the deal. i got to get us reinvigorated. I think we're losing steam. Here we go. Okay, so the deal is like this. God says that Purim is about eradicating self-doubt. You have to believe in yourself. Never give up hope. Never give up hope. (laughs) Never give up hope. Good point. And he says that if that's true, I need you to know that you can ask anything from me on Purim. But you know what? It doesn't just work this way. If you can ask anything of me, then anyone can ask anything of you. There's a line that says, Kol haposhet yad notnim lo. Anyone who extends their hand to you on Purim, you have to give. If a poor person asks you for charity on Purim, you have no choice. If you only have a 50 in your wallet, you have no choice. Kol haposhet yad, anyone who asks you for anything on Purim, you give it. Why? Because we're asking Hashem to take away our greatest pain, all of our self-doubt. And Hashem says, no problem. You want me to give you everything? Give everyone else everything. Hashem is always game to do anything for us that we're willing to do for other people. Okay. I'm sorry, Facebook Live. Low battery. Uh Uh-oh. Okay, um, Abby, do you have a power pack? Does anyone have a spare power pack here? Do we have an extension cord? Oh, we have such an extension cord. Okay. Not exactly an extension cord. It's not an extension cord? Not exactly. We have a long enough. Yeah, let's try. I don't want to give up on the Facebook world. Should we have a song in the meantime so I don't feel so awkward standing here? You have a power pack! I love you! I don't even know your name! I wanted to ask you your name before! Come! Come, Rachel the Cat! Meow! Yay! Applause for Rachel the Cat! Rachel! 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 Uh, let's see. Looks like it's turned on. Yeah? All right, let's hope so. Amazing. Okay, okay, great. Did we take a two second break and we're ready to roll? Yeah. All right, this is the crew that's really interested in learning. I'm gonna give it 15 more minutes. Don't worry, I'm gonna cut out half the cards. Can we have 15 minutes of total focus? Okay, my friends in the back, can you come back in? Can we do this? Can we do this? Okay, yeah, those that need to, oh, this was perfect. Everybody who needs to leave is leaving. Bye. Bye.
We'll miss you. Just kidding. I'm just kidding. Sorry. Okay, Bonnie and crew, can you guys come back in? Oh, perfect. Now there's chairs for people that need. Okay, anybody who needs to leave, go. We're going to start again. Rabbeinu, Sha'ag, Bekol Gadol, Ein Shum Yehush, Ein Shum Yehush, Ein Shum Yehush, Ba'olam Kla. All right, can we refocus? Let's do another countdown. 15 minutes, guys, 15 minutes. We're going to get strong and support. 15 minutes. Bye. Here we go. 10, 9, 8, 7, help me. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay, friends in the back. I'm going to get really strict. Friends in the back. If you want to talk, totally do it on the other outside area because I'm so distracted and this Torah is so strong and I want to bless everybody who wants it to have it. Okay, if you're talking, totally fine. Just do it on the other outside. Thank you for your patience, Facebook. Okay, Anna, can you get the people in the back to come on in? Homies in the back. I need your help, please. You're still talking and I can't deal with it. Don't they get it? Can you turn around and tell those homies to, that... Uh, oh, it's Daniela. Daniela, help me out, girl. What you doing? Come on, Daniela. So Rip Shlomo says that if we knew... Okay, no, no, hold on, hold on. Let's take a deep breath. Do we have 15 minutes of attention span? Yes. Okay. I smile and laugh a lot, but this isn't easy to stand up here. I really do need your help. We love you. I also Ooh. love you. I also love you. I just need I just need us to pull the energy in. I know I'm asking a lot. Okay, we ready? Yeah. Sweet. Rav Shlomo says, if you knew what heights you reached when you hear the Megillah, the whole entire world would come hear it. If you knew the heights you reached, every little Indian and Asian and African would be running to the shuls to join us. The Megillah is very high. It's the roots of the Torah. Okay. And you know what the Megillah is all about? I have a question. How long, how long was the Purim story? Is that like, did it take course, course over like a week, a month, a year? So from the time that Esther became queen until Haman declared his declaration against the Jews was nine years. And the full story is debatable if it took 11 or 13. So you know what Rav Shlomo says? Listen to this. Baba Jun. It's his house. He gets a, he gets a permit. Rav Shlomo says, you know what the Megillah is all about? Remember, what's our whole theme for the night? We're obliterating self-doubt, right? He says, the Megillah is, unless you know the whole story from the beginning to the end, you don't know anything. We're all in the middle of our stories right now. Every one of us that's still longing for that thing, that's suffering from what we don't have or what we do have, unless you know the whole story, you don't know anything. It says that when Eliyahu and Mashiach come, and everything comes to the end, and the whole story of the Jewish people, it's going to be so clear to us. And you know what's going to be clear? It's going to be clear that God was leading us the entire time. He was taking us by the hand. And that, that means that everyone here, Sabrina, me, you, Justin, that everyone in their personal life, sometimes we get so angry at God, but you know, sometimes you feel so hurt, and we think, God, why are you doing this to me? I think I left that in a voice note to my friend this morning. <laughs> I just don't get why God is doing this to me. You know what Rapsoma says? Wait. 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 One day it's going to be so clear to you that God was taking you by the hand the whole time. One day it's going to be clear that God is so, so good to me. Just right now in the middle of the story. The story's not over. There's hope for all of us.
says, Yom Kippurimi, we're going to go there in a minute. So he said, we said that you have to get drunk on Purim. You have to get drunk on Purim only to abandon your own headspace. Because what does your headspace say? South out. Not going to work. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not rich enough. I'm not smart enough. And here's the good one. There must be something wrong with me. Right? Who hasn't had that thought? There's just there's something wrong with me. Has any, anyone else? Just me? Yeah, this is our big one, right? There must be something wrong with me. So we have to get drunk. Why? Not because Hashem's like, ooh, frat party. But because we have, to, we have to get beyond our headspace that tells us there's something wrong with us and forgets that we're in the middle of the story. But so you know what else our voda is on Purim? We have to give other people that back too. On Purim, we're supposed to walk around not drunk on alcohol. I don't even like alcohol personally. I opened it truly. I was so excited. I was like, oh, God, somebody take this from me. <laughs> I mean, thank you so much, Darren, for bringing it wherever you are. But I mean, like, ugh. <laughs> but why do we have to get drunk? We have to re-fall in love, not with ourselves, but with everyone. You know what kind of drunk you have to be? You have to be that kind of drunk that's like, I love you, man. You are so pretty. <laughs> you know, I was embarrassed to tell you this morning, but you are so pretty. We have to be the drunk that gets, the, the, the one that falls in love with everybody. That's our work on Purim. It's not just, woo, get drunk. It's get drunk so that you can forget your headspace that, oh, I don't like her because she did that. I forget about that. I love you. I love you, man. Our work is to not just reinstill our love in ourselves, but to make everybody reinstill their confidence in them. Yeah. Yeah, be that drunk. And you know what? Because someone said here that Purim is like Yom Kippur, right? So we know this. It's a deep teaching. I was going to teach it, but the time went. Here's the thing. Yom Kippurim. The highest day of the year, right? Yom Kippurim is the highest day of the year, right? Yom Kippur? Yes. Yes. Wrong. <laughs> Yom Kippurim is Yom Kippurim, a day like Purim. Why, says Reb Shlomo? Listen to this teaching. We learned it in Leia's house on Shabbos. Because on Yom Kippur, you walk around and you say, please, will you forgive me? Please, will you forgive me? And on Purim, you walk around and say, man, did anything bad ever happen between us? <laughs> I love you already. On Yom, on Yom Kippur, you ask for forgiveness. But on Yom Kippur, you get so drunk on love, you already forgave. On Purim, you get so drunk on love that you already forgave. And that's why Yom Kippur is a day like Purim. Reb Shlomo says, you know the difference between a holy drunk and a not holy drunk? A not holy drunk looks around, and if he sees 10 people, he sees 100. But on Purim, a holy drunk... All he sees is one. Wow. You don't get it? No, I don't Unity, oneness, love, brotherhood. <laughs> yeah, Reb Shlomo says that on Purim, if you see ten, on, if you're a not holy drunk, you look around the room and you think you see ten people, there's like a hundred, you're spinning. A holy drunk looks around and all they see is one. Oneness. And that's, this is the whole thing. Purim, all the costumes, all the alcohol, the meal, the work, it's all just to drop the self out, tell Amalek to shut the heck up already, start loving ourselves so that we can love each other. And that's why Purim is going to be the only holiday that exists after Mashiach. Okay, some people add Hanukkah, but the idea is because what's Mashiach? We dropped all the faribles. We dropped all the upset. We dropped all the self-doubt. And now, Messianic times, we can all just love each other. Purim is a taste of Mashiach. We're going to come to a close. You guys ready for this? Uh, there's so much longer. I skipped half this year, but... Okay, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cross us back over into the Parsha for a second because I said I'd say a word about the Parsha, and this is thanks to Allison, wherever you are. So the Parsha, and we'll tie it all together. The Parsha is Vayikra. And Vayikra, weirdly enough, in this book of Leviticus, is all about the korbanot, the sacrifices. So the, the teaching that's so, so simple is that korban comes from the root of the word. A korban is a sacrifice. Everyone knows what a sacrifice is? If you open Vayikra, you're going to be like, what? It's like all sacrifices. It's really, really intense, especially if you're vegetarian. Korban comes from the root of the word... Karov. God didn't want us just to kill animals and bring them to Jerusalem. God wants us to do the work to get close to him. That's the whole thing. 
Vayikra is all about coming close to God. And how do you do that? Why do we bring sacrifices? We say, God, I messed up. I'm sorry. Forgive me. This whole week, these coming weeks are all about forgiving ourselves, forgiving each other. And the only way to do that is to start believing in ourselves again. That's it. You're not perfect. I'm not perfect. We'll never be. So l'chaim, let's get drunk and love each other anyways. And again, I'm really not advertising for alcohol. Like you can get drunk on you. I just want to make that really clear. I'm not. Yeah, drunk on love. Okay, so let's say like this. You know, we said we have to get so drunk to go beyond our mindset, the mindset that says, I am limited, you're limited, we can't make this work, that's not going to happen. Purim is about getting so drunk you lose your headspace. You, you have to realize, you know, what's that famous quote, the wise person knows they don't know anything? It's like a famous... Yeah, okay, so here's the thing. Purim is all about the masechot, the masks, right? Shannon had an awesome mask on, where'd you go? There you are. Yeah. It's about masechot. I want to share with you just a really super cool teaching about masechot. Does anyone know how we call a tractate in the Gemara, in the Talmud? Does anyone see a Talmud? Does anyone ever see the art school version of the Talmud? It literally starts over here. Book, 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 goes all the way to here. Anyone see the full set of the Gemara, of the Talmud? The Talmud is the oral tradition written down, right? Has anyone ever, has anyone seen a Gemara? It's so hardcore. If you open it, it's like, ah! There's so much information in there, right? What is, and, and there's like a lot of tractates, right? If you have one tractate, does anyone know what this is called in Hebrew? A masechet, a masechta. In other words, everything we know in Judaism comes from what? A masechet, a mask. In other words, the Gemara, the whole Talmud, is just a little mask for that which is behind it. The whole Gemara the whole Talmud is just like a masechet, it's a mask. You know how much light is behind that? And that's the idea of Purim and what we're supposed to tune into. We don't know anything. We don't know anything. All I know is that behind that woman right there, there is so much infinite light. Oh yeah, you could turn your head, but it's okay. It's good, I'm embarrassing you, you'll get bracha. Bless us all in your heart. But seriously, that's the point of Purim. We have to get out of our head, above our head, so that we can know that all that Amalek garbage, all that Haman snake energy is lying to me. And I have to do the personal work, whatever it takes, to eradicate the self-doubt myself, so that I could forgive myself, so I could forgive you, so we could just get together and bring Mashiach already. So, like Rav Pinchas, whose tradition, whose usual trajectory, whose model reality was walking into work and going, hey guys, walking into class and going, hey, cool, walks home and says, hey, honey, I'm home, says to his kids, yeah, cool, good night. That was the original paradigm because he didn't believe in himself. But then the Rebbe, the Magid of Mezrach, blessed him. He blessed him, I give you the strength of Purim. What's the strength of Purim? It's beyond what you know. You're beyond what you know. And your friends and Amisrael are beyond what you know. So let's forget the rest. And just love each other. That's it. That's it. So may the Rebona Shal bless us tonight in the light of everything we learned from the story of Pinchas who said... The story of Pinchas where we learned about Purim and then we went through everything that's happening. We learned about Parshat that it's Parshat Vayikra. We learned that it's Shabbat Zachor. We have to remember to wipe out Amalek, wipe out self-doubt. We learned that what's coming up right after Shabbat is the fast. And we fast on with Esther because... Because she fasted, because when you fast, you do tshuva. And when you do tshuva, you return to yourself. Because when we're depressive and when we're sad, we say, I don't feel myself. We want to return to ourselves. And after the fast, we go into Purim. And on Purim, we hear the Megillah, we go to bed. We wake up and get the party started with four M's? Megillah. Awesome. And we learn now that all of these things, there are tikkun on a Rosh saying, give up hope, your temple will never be built. And then we learn about the meal that we go to, to do that fixing. And we learn about the gifts because we're reinstilling our belief in each other. Mm? Yes. And then what else do we learn? 
<laughs> we learn about getting drunk on learn. We learn about going beyond self doubt. We learn that Purim is a real avoda. And we learn that if we can actually have the strength of Purim, we walk into our houses. Literally, I, but I, I, I invite you to try this tonight, or especially on Purim. Go home to the person you love that you're struggling with and just say, Good Purim! Walk into your house tonight, walk into your roommate's room, bust open the door and be like, You're so precious to me! And see if the entire dynamic changes. So what's happening now is that we're living in this crazy reality, but a Purim is going to come and God crashes down the heavens and he says, I love you!